welcome to the Exxon Magazine podcast. Dive deep with us into the mesmerizing world of immersive tech, where we bring you conversations with the trailblazers of XR, AI, and spatial computing. If you're curious about what's on the horizon and eager to be inspired, you're in the right place. Tune in and let's explore the digital frontier together. Today in the podcast, we're speaking with Robert Signor, who is a seasoned leader in technology for seniors and is dedicated to crafting innovative solutions that combat social isolation and loneliness among older adults. With an impressive track record, he co-founded and is the president of the Tribe Pavilion Incorporated, a metaverse-based nonprofit. His visionary leadership in VR AR is underscored by his commitment to leveraging cutting edge technology, including social virtual reality and the metaverse, to enrich the lives of seniors and foster meaningful connections. It sounds amazing. I'm super curious to know how he has unfolded all his strategies to support these important segment in the society who are seniors. Thank you so much, Robert, for being here. I can't wait to begin. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Robert, for being here today. We're super excited. You have such a beautiful project that you're going to let us know about today. But let's begin by what is your background? What is your story that actually led you eventually to Tribe Pavilion? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so my name is Rob Signori, and I'm president of an organization called uh, the Thrive Pavilion. We are a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to uh, help older adults overcome loneliness and social isolation using the metaverse. Uh, my background is I've always been uh, involved with technology. Um, my, I have a, a bachelor's in computer science and have been involved with a lot of startups and a lot of emerging technologies really since the PC days. Generally get involved with tech as businesses are starting to operationalize it. So that happened with PCs and client server and the internet and mobile, um, it, uh, IoT. So I've been involved with a lot of startups uh, throughout my career. Uh, but one of the last uh, companies that I was uh, had worked for was uh, a company that made technology that is used in um, uh, organized social senior living here in the United States. Uh, they're called uh, continuing care retirement communities. And generally, those communities uh, start where an older adult may move in there, where they're relatively independent, maybe as a, as a couple, a husband or wife will, will move in. And then over time, as um, their health may start to fail, uh, there are different levels of care that might uh, be from needing just assistance with some uh, activities of daily living all the way to skilled nursing care, sort of like a continuum of care in these communities. But I was working for uh, a company as their chief product officer, making uh, technologies, uh, mostly mobile, uh, quite a bit of uh, voice with Amazon products um, for the residents uh, to find out like what's the what's for dinner or what the um, uh, what activities were happening at the community so that they could socialize. And what happened uh, during the pandemic was um, the all that socializing really stopped, right? So one of the reasons why people move into these communities is, it has a built-in social network, so, social circle, lots of activities. And um, was during that pandemic, that all kind of halted. And the industry, I think, did a really good job of trying to use things like Zoom calls, like we're, like we're doing today, or YouTube videos, et cetera, to keep the uh, social aspects of the community going. And I think what it did was it did a, it did a good job of keeping uh, residents engaged and entertained, but there, just as we all suffered during the pandemic, 
there was a lot of uh, loneliness and isolation. People are in their apartments and really not interacting with, with people. Um, kind of uh, I, what I did was um, also in my personal life, of course, during the pandemic, sort of faced with the same thing. Uh, I have uh, grown children. Uh, they live far away from me. I live in North Carolina. Uh, my daughter lives in uh, San Diego. I have a, uh, a son who lives overseas. But we were kind of faced with the same uh, dilemma as being uh, socially isolated from one another. And my daughter and I started to experiment with uh, virtual reality as a way to, you know, we did the Zoom calls. We did the Animal Crossing. We did all those things that people did during the pandemic. And uh, we also exper exper experimented with virtual reality uh, with uh, the MetaQuest uh, headsets. And one night uh, we were we were playing a game together um, where you kind of make sandwiches in the same location and you have to fulfill orders and whatnot, just having a great time. And after I was done, my wife asked, well, what were you guys doing? Because you were just really, it sounds like you were having a really great time. So I told her uh, what what we were doing. The next night or a couple nights later, uh, my wife wanted to try it. I had an older headset, so the three of us were able to get together and uh, play this game. And after we were done, my wife remarked, um, even though she knew that my daughter wasn't in the room, she felt like she was really there, that she hadn't interacted with my daughter in that way for like a year and a half. And then it really felt like she was in the same room. They could high five each other. They could see each other laughing. And really had a significant emotional impact on her. Um, and that's, so I kind of put two and two together from what was happening professionally in senior living and then what was happening in personal life as ideas usually happen, right? And um, as we were sort of entering 2022, the thought kind of occurred to me, gee, I wonder if there are older adults, one that use this type of technology or currently using it. Could you put together something that was specifically designed around uh, socializing so that you're doing things together in the same place uh, and activities that are reasonably designed around um, the areas of wellness that are very that you want to focus on, whether it's um, uh, health related or intellectual or you know socializing or 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 fun, et cetera. And could you put together, uh, uh, um, a, a program where people, A, could, would they come, would they continue to come, and could you sustain it? Those are really the things that when we started back in April of 2022, those are the questions we wanted to ask, and would, of course, would it help with, oh, to overcome social isolation? That's kind of, That was kind of the genesis of uh, what the Thrive Pavilion is. So it is the real senior community. It just so happens to be located in the metaverse where seniors from all over the world, but mostly North America, United States and Canada, come and participate in uh, activities that they do with one another, at least once one a day. Um, and they vary from uh, uh, just social activities like celebrating birthdays or uh, playing uh, card games or other type of uh, physical games like bocce. Um, we'll go and do things like go to go to the theater or attend, um, um, uh, you know, like medical seminars that may be given, et cetera. So, and we do, we do it as a community and, and so far it's been going pretty well. Wow. That's uh, fantastic to hear all of this amazing story, especially for this uh, segment of the population that tends to be sometimes forgotten that mm -hmm. in situations, extreme situations, as it happened with the pandemic, they, they were requiring a lot of help and support because if they don't even have contact with the immediate family, even in their own places, the social connection was cut, as you mentioned. So yeah, that is a very beautiful example and solution that you uh, pertain to creator. Um, my question would be now, now you said you're at the stage where you said, the, yes, there is this connection between the personal and the professional. Let's create, let's say, the beginning of Thrive Pavilion. How did you come up with the specific activities that they might like and how do you design them and develop them? How was that process? Yeah, sure. That's, that's a great question. So um, obviously our real focus in, in, our, in the beginning and even now is we wanted to focus on the why, which I think is really the most important thing to make sure that you understand. 
uh, particularly with my you know product management and chief product officer background knowing the why is probably the most important because things will kind of can flow from there you can figure out you know what to do and how to do it etc uh particularly because we really focus on an emotional why right we were really focused and even though and it's fine to even focus on a negative emotion and and that's where our focus lies, right? Our focus lies on loneliness, mostly, right? Uh, and then how do you overcome loneliness? So it's okay. That, so that's the why we really um, um, focus on. What we decided to do, um, given that uh, we wanted to uh, be able to try something quick and also iterate on it very quickly, um, we went and uh, chose a metaverse platform that was as close to zero as possible to development for. Um, and that's why we landed on using uh, Meta's Horizon Worlds. Um, it has one, it's relatively easy to develop for, um, even for people that have, let's say, no programming experience. Um, you can iterate with it very quickly. And there is a good uh, uh, community of creators that are building uh, experiences you know, our building worlds that we have an opportunity to partner with and then incorporate them into our activities. Um, so that was a reason why um, we chose, a couple of the reasons why we chose to go with uh, go with Horizon Worlds. Um, because there, 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 are a lot, there are a lot of good activities. When we look at like the, I, I mentioned these dimensions of wellness. So some of it's like physical activity, some of it is emotional, spiritual activity. So what we did was, is we looked at, at partners that were building uh, that either had built or could build things, um, whether someone built a, let's say a, a, a bocce world or a cornhole world. So we will partner with that creator and then run our activities um, in their world. Um, we, a creator recently built, let's say a trivia type, type of world. So we'll go, it's good mental and cognitive stimulation to do trivia and they, they customized it for our, uh, with questions and whatnot that are relevant for our age group. Um, and we've also built a couple of our own worlds as well. Obviously we have the Thrive Pavilion, it's in Horizon Worlds. So we did go ahead and build that. Um, and it's really just a gathering, mostly it's a gathering place. We will do some events there as well. Like we'll have our book club that meets once a month. So we'll meet, we'll meet at the pavilion. Um, we may have a guest speaker come in and they'll, they'll speak in our little area. Um, but mostly it's a gathering place and then we'll, we'll go to um, other worlds that people have built or some of the worlds that we've uh, gone ahead and built as well. But we really look at um, what we have noticed and the feedback that we get from our members is some like the games, some really like the card games, some people really like the dice games or whatever it may be. There are other people that just honestly like to get together with other people. Like this afternoon, we had our just our social hour, coffee hour. We, we literally do nothing, right? Other than other than get together and build some social connections and and people talk with one another. So uh, we we try and vary what we offer so that there's something for hopefully something for everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's an amazing approach because I can see how good it is to leverage and to actually make even broaden the community as a company, as Drive Pavilion, by using the collaborations, by using mm -hmm. the other creators' spaces. I mean, I think that that's a very smart move rather than you trying to recreate the whole thing by yourself when you know yeah. that there are some there that can serve the same purpose so that's, that's amazing right. that's, that's a pretty yeah. good strategy thank you for sharing that that's a very good like golden idea there for anybody who is trying to do the same maybe creating that community that could be an approach that could work as well thank you so when it comes to the acquisition of these platforms of users of certain demographics probably we see more often how the platforms are successful with more younger generations because they mm -hmm. are closer to technology, et cetera. Yeah. So for me, it comes as very impressive to be able to have a community 
of a population segment that is a little bit older and we might think sure. they might not yeah. be as in contact with the technology. So that's my question mm -hmm. for you. How did you do that? <laughs> yeah, so so certainly right right now, since our membership is, is really growing just organically, Mm -hmm. um, so it tends to be people, it started out certainly for everybody, the folks that joined early were people that already had headsets and they found us through our social media or maybe things that we were doing in Horizon. So uh, our initial members were definitely invested already in, in the technology. What we have found over time is uh, a lot of those members have talked to, let's say their, their uh, in real life friends Mm -hmm. and said, hey, there's something really interesting that I'm involved with. Why don't you join us and may go out and buy a headset? Uh -huh. So they are, so they're, so they're, they're friends. They're bringing their in real life friends to us now. That happens uh, pretty often. Uh, and then sometimes there are also people that they may have already met online, uh, maybe playing like walkabout mini golf or involved in some other community. And then they'll bring us, bring those people to thrive. So it kind of, kind of works both ways. What I have, um, and, and certainly um, being working with older adults and technology for a good part of my career, you certainly, um, it, it's not uncommon to think that older adults are not particularly good with, with high tech. And when we, when we think about high tech, what we're really talking about is the mobile internet, which is essentially a two-dimensional interface that you that you interact with the tip of your finger, right? Mm -hmm. And and for all the, uh, in what that technology comes with, it comes with a huge amount of abstractions from a user interface perspective. Mm -hmm. So if you think of the task that you're trying to do, it is, it, it has, it's full of abstractions because it's two dimensional and you interact with it with mostly the tip of your finger. Mm -hmm. And that's what older adults are not very good with because they didn't learn the abstractions maybe like we learned the abstractions or or younger people have come up learning the abstractions what i find with virtual reality and not to say that there aren't any abstractions in vr however those abstractions start to go away because the interface is relatively skeuomorphic so what you learned when you were a baby on how to walk or how to talk or turn your head or push a button with, with your finger, all those tactile things that we all learned when we were younger. Uh, virtual reality is mimicking that, that you know, that uh, it's mimicking real life. So a lot of those abstractions of using technology have gone away. And the since provided a, the technology that they're using, like VR is returning some sort of benefit. Anything that, what I've noticed is kind of learning through and getting sort of that uncomfortableness of learning something new um, it, it is like, they will, they will, they will try it. You know, just a, an example of like, what's the difference between a two-dimensional abstraction and in VR, I always come back to this. Um, we were, one of the events that we did was we were playing um, the game Family Feud, which is a television show, game show in the United States, uh, very, very popular. But one of the creators on the Horizon platform had created something like it. Mm -hmm. So our community went and we went to play it. And we were with a relatively uh, uh, new member who was not necessarily used to mm -hmm. the technology. Uh, or, uh, you know, which she was new to VR as well. And she came up to like, there's a podium in the beginning where two people come up and they're asking questions and someone has to push the button first, you know, and then they get to answer. So I had to ex explain what was going on to her. And she asked me the question, I was like, well, how do I push the button? Right, if you think about it, if it was a two dimensional interface, mm -hmm. you know, you would say, well, you hit some combination of ASDF and the space bar or right menu, you know, some abstraction to do that work. Where here in virtual reality, the answer was you stick your arm out and with your hand, you press the button. And she mm -hmm. was like, oh, that's really simple, right? So the technology is, is, since the technology is getting so powerful now that we get to interact with computers the way our bodies are designed. And I think that's where the real benefit of virtual reality is, particularly when it comes to older adults. Um, 
and it continues to get better with hand, you know, hand gestures and all that stuff. It just, it, all those abstractions will start to melt away and it'll become much easier for people who aren't what we think of not being good with technology will, will be able to, to use it. Mm -hmm. That sounds super on point and exciting. I'm actually writing a book right now about interfaceless, which mm-hmm. is the no use of typical interfaces in 3D spaces, because as we can see the technology, we're not going to have to use it. And yeah. at some point, artificial intelligence is going to understand our needs at the point that is going to help us to bring the menus or the activities that we want yeah. without having to perform or use to the interface. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's I think, I think that... The, the the what we call you of the field of UI UX, yeah. we're going to look back on that in like 30 years and said that was such an anomaly yes, in terms yes. of humans interaction with technology. Absolutely. I was I was recently designing a game and for for Thrive. And part of the game is you have to sign up that you want to that you want to play the game. Mm-hmm. And I, I got kind of caught in the sort of the 2D way of doing that where you would you know, press something or touch a button. And I was like, well, if this was the real world, you would use like a clipboard and a pencil, right? And we're and since we're in this platform that's skeuomorphic, really should design the signing up process as a clipboard and a pencil because people would be like, oh, I want to put my name on the list. How do I put my name on the list? <laughs> clipboard in this hand, pencil in this hand, and you sign up. I don't have to learn that. There, it's not an, you know, the we can need to, we need to start to think about re, as we go to these three D interfaces to remove a lot of the two D uh, or two D thinking and 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 that's one of the things that I noticed with um, and it's a bit of a tangent but uh, what I noticed with the um, Vision Pro from Apple mm-hmm, yeah. is that they're still stuck in this this two dimensional interface they they they're totally stuck in it because yes. and they're good at it. Right, they basically created these two D interfaces, yeah. but they've carried it over to this three D product, and I, I think they'll realize quickly, oh, that's not right. We don't have to do that, but but it did. I noticed in like their demos that a lot of that stuff is carried over, and it's like you don't need it. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'm actually bringing oh that example as well to the book, yeah, and I am yeah, and I, I am can't wait the for the level. book. That's great. Yeah, with, with the level yeah. of sensor sensors, hardware mm-hmm. mixed with algorithms. That mm-hmm. is not needed. We can create experiences that don't need all of that. So that's yeah. amazing. I, I find finally as well, someone who actually has been reflected on that yeah. is creating maybe experiences towards that. Because mm-hmm. of that, I'm going to invite you to have another additional chat for another day. Of course, yeah, that's great. But I'm super mm-hmm. excited to hear about your experience. And perhaps mm-hmm. I can borrow one of your examples with what older, for example, audiences might need and how this type of approach to design can actually yeah. support these type of people if we're speaking about inclusivity if we're speaking right. about best practices of design mm-hmm. that's super exciting robert yeah. i'm super super glad that you have shared so much wisdom with us and all the stuff that you're doing not only your a uh, platform is about social impact but your approach to how you're creating it is uh, making a different wave into the way that we are designing right now. And I'm super excited uh, to hear that. Thank you so much, Robert. How can people get a hold of you or uh, what What else would you, you like them to know about your uh, platform, how they, how they can access uh, Thrive Pavilion? Sure. So we have, we have our website, thrivepavilion.org. Uh, on there, we have our activity calendar is, po- is posted there. We keep that up to date. We have a very active uh, social media presence uh, on Facebook and Instagram, also called Thrive Pavilion. And there's a lot of activity that actually happens outside of VR with our members. And a lot of it happens in the Facebook group. So it's a very active community, both in, inside when, when we're in the metaverse, but also outside of the metaverse as well. Lots of communication happens and goes on there. A lot of friendships built, et cetera. So that is a great way for people to um, learn more about Thrive or follow what we're doing. We certainly would love to have you participate. We are um, the Thrive Pavilion is located inside of Horizon Worlds. Um, you can just search for Thrive Pavilion. Our activity calendar is there as well. We'd love to have you uh, come join us. If you 
are an older adult or have an older adult, like a mom or a dad or an aunt or a grandma, who you think this might really be helpful for? Because our, our uh, demographic are mostly people living at home alone, usually from the ages of about late 50s to 80s. Our oldest members are, are in their 80s. Um, but lots of people in their 60s and 70s, but mostly mostly living at home for and um, are isolated for various reasons, health, um, it, uh, lack of transportation, um, smaller friend circle, which happens when, when you get older, but people can join us, join us there as well anytime. Yeah, thank you so much. And as you just heard, Robert, if you ever have a family member or any other family uh, person that maybe might be within this uh, circle that might have a benef benefit from this, please share this talk and invite them to visit Tri Pavilion. Thank you so much and see you in the next episode. Bye for now.